how goes it, Mr. Newberg? <clears throat> Let me tell you, folks. She is going fine, like spiffy fine. We are launching the 16th season of this outfit. Can you believe that? I promised my wife I'd only do this for 10 years and then we'd go fish into the far Netherlands. And here we are. Six years past my promise. Thank you, darling. Appreciate you putting up with me. But she says it takes me a long time to get my work done, so. I mean, what more could I ask for? It rained, it cooled it off. All the early season people got it out of their system. It's supposed to be in the 50s and 60s. And I got an elk tag. And I got Michael. We're shooting something. I don't know what. Here's the problem. Well, not a problem. Yeah, kind of a problem. I'm down to nothing but a little bit of mule deer meat left in my freezer from Matthew's mule deer last year. I stole some of it from him. So, there's a really good chance that a cow elk or a spike, or maybe we should get the Raghorn Express going, Michael. Yeah. Michael's putting together some t-shirts, he said, for the Raghorn Express. If we shoot a Raghorn, we're going to have to get some t-shirts done. We'll have to launch them. There we go. There. Launch a new brand of clothing, the Raghorn Express. The big RE. Brand new outhouse here. I'm going to be using that. five grouse a day and we're allowed any elk I'm, I'm not shooting a spotted calf but a bull a cow uh, I'm gonna try to keep everything under 30 yards which as thick as the timber is here I think hopefully we can do that I just I don't need the headache to come with trying to go very far but if we shoot one I brought the 12 gauge with slugs and buckshot because when we go back in there for the meat, the thing that freaks me out the worst of hunting in grizzly country isn't necessarily the hunting in grizzly country, it's the game retrieval in grizzly country. So, we'll be packing a 12 gauge with some slugs and some. The last one in there is double lot buck. It's like, okay, if I miss him the first two times and he's that close, I need some double up buck. Let's hope we don't need that. Burn hole. Take off a little bit there. Headlights. We almost ran over a grouse right here. He flew from right here up in this tree somewhere. I can't see him though. He's beyond that that pine or that. go down. It was one of my finer grouse shots. <laughs> Flying through the fir trees, he goes through one opening, right in a beak. Big old boy.
Don't leave home without it. The infamous grouse point. <clears throat> now I might want to put another grouse point in my pack. I know what Michael's thinking. Michael's thinking, Randy, for being a guy who's always in a hurry and got to be chop, chop, and here and there and everywhere, you sure are taking your sweet time this morning. Uh-oh. Where'd my spare grouse head go? Well, that took a long time. Is there any elk bugle in Michael? No. Mm. Even with all that obstruction and debris, somebody finds a way to take their ATV into a non-motorized area. Follow this divide all the way up. Go look over into those other basins. See what we might see. This is today. Go up here and see where this opening goes. Crawl up there.
these are fresh tracks, right? We're fresh tracks, these are fresh tracks. They're going that way. I think they might have fed out here on all this grass last night. Dropped off that other side somewhere to bed. This trail loops around. We're gonna try to stay on this trail and be quiet. I don't know how far they might be.
see old dead logs freshly tore up and rolled over like this really good chance it's a bear looking for grubs and ants and moths and anything else they can find in there getting up here where all the good grass is just broke out of the lodge poles now up here on the upper side of those lodge poles is all this grass and then this these fur kind of strands of timber. There's no tracks up here. I'm just pasted with tracks down in the lodge pole. I don't know if they like bedding in there better. I suppose. It'd be harder to get away from a bear or a lion or whatever else if you're in the lodge poles. Here you could outrun a wolf or whatever if you're an elk. Oh well. Shows what I know. I've ever told you this story about grouse and why they're so high on my list. No? Well, this gets to be a little bit personal. It might be more than people need to know. But when I was nine, my parents divorced and my life seemed really messed up. Like everything you thought was normal was wrong. I mean, like you had this idea of the world and poof, and so I had a younger sister and a younger brother. 
and my mom was trying to raise us in an old, old trailer house. And down below the trailer house was what was called the Indian Trail that followed the river all the way to the, the state forest. And I used to go down there fishing and hunting. And that's where I found my sanity during this really insane period of my life. And I'd shoot grouse. And if I came home with two grouse, my mom was so excited because we weren't having some sort of egg salad sandwiches again for the 14th time in the last two weeks. We were going to have grouse. So if you wonder where my grouse guess, enthusiasm comes from, grouse hunting at a very formidable time of my early years 12 or 13 or whatever gave me a lot of sanity that was where the where a world that didn't make any sense because you know in 1974 a divorce was not the norm it was like a stigma and so your whole world's coming unwound and then you go over here in the natural world makes so much sense and everything's sane and peaceful and you go there you get something to eat you bring it home so that's where i started my grouse problem and haven't got over it 45 whatever 46 years later so when you see me that excited about a grouse just know it brings me back to a special time in my life when the grouse in the wild places bailed me out of a lot of trouble. Let's go find one. One more. <clears throat> one thing around here are deer tracks. Well, the ATVs made it up here, or a couple of them. And when they see us, they'll turn around or stop or wonder what they're doing. This guy, he turned it off. But, oh well. I don't know what he's doing. But we're going to go back to where the elk are, because this is where all the ATVs are. Hmm. What happens when you hunt near ATV trails? Mm -hmm. I knew this trail was here. In fact, I walked in on it for quite a ways. Just part of the gig. But what happens? There's an ATV trail up here. There's an ATV trail way down there. The mid section is where the elk were today. I mean, there's feed everywhere up here for elk, but if you got that kind of stuff, humming by all the time. Yeah, I'll go find some other place. <laughs> we stopped here on this rock. I said, boy, these nice flat rocks look like a good spot to take a break. I leaned my bugle tube right there. I was playing around with my bear spray, trying to get it in the proper side. And I told Michael, come on, let's go, burning daylight. And I walked away without my flute. This was a relief because I only brought one with. Hopefully that wind comes out of the 
Well, almost nine miles today. Didn't see an elk, but heard them. And uh, covered a lot of country. But when you think about how much country is here, we didn't cover that much of it. But probably the biggest thing for me on this hunt is the apprehension, the anxiety of how my arm would hold up. It's pretty sore right now from tracking and carrying my bow half the time. I don't know if you can tell that, but yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I ended up with a big bump here. I severed the tendon that connects here and the tendon that connects these two fingers. And uh, they're doing pretty good, except this one right here. They couldn't reconstruct that one. They got my two fingers fixed. So, without having a tendon on the outside, it has a tendency to want to pull in like this. And it's hard to move it that way, and it's hard to put force on it that way. So, we'll see how it holds up so far. So good. I was very diligent about my physical therapy for the last five months, so hopefully that's paying dividends. But I might wake up in the morning and say, oh my gosh, what the heck happened to my arm? But one thing about a beautiful day like today, it reminds me how much I love this. How much I love these beautiful places and spaces and the thrill of hearing an elk bugle, even though you can't see it. And it might be far away. I don't know how you put into words how thrilling and exhilarating that is. It just is. Man. And we get to do it in this country out on these public lands. I don't know how many seasons Nobody knows how many seasons they got left, but I, I'm really thankful that Michael said, ah, yeah, I'll join you. And uh, we went out here today and didn't launch an arrow. I didn't even have a close encounter, but just a reminder of how cool it is, how lucky I am. I often say I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and my job is to get up every day and prove it. Well, today I'm proving it, or I think I am, anyhow.
trying my best. But I'm gonna try across this beaver pond here. There's gotta be a dam somewhere. I don't really care to demonstrate my dog paddling skills here with the full pack on. If I come out the other side soaking wet, you'll know that I didn't find the, the crossing. <clears throat> what we got going here? We got some of Matthew's Wyoming meal deer about ready to be put in with the sauce here. Mm -mm -mm. The marinara, the penne noodles. Got Michael the Italian here. We gotta <laughs> gotta keep him going, but I'm sure this wouldn't even pass as is there an I a fast food Italian joint? Uh Fizzoli's. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever, ever really heard of that one, but Okay. I mean I'm pretty sure that the, the Italian folks washing this are like Randy. Come on, man. <laughs> Must have got fat last night. <laughs> Little admission on my part here. I uh, ended up messing with my alarm last night, and uh, I had I set it for 5:20 p.m. instead of 5:20 a.m. But fortunately, I had to pee really bad about 5.45. So, we only overslept by a little bit. Happens to the worst of us. These elk tracks were near when we walked out yesterday. And it rained hard again last night. I'm convinced 
there's an elk around here. There's just too many cows been out feeding for there not to be a bull around. But I can be as convinced as I want. If they're not convinced, nothing really matters. We'll find one that wants to beagle. I don't think we're gonna just drop down and continue around. We got about a hundred foot drop there. Yeah. I can see why the trail ends right here. Well, we hoofed it all the way up here to the top today. You can see forever out there. And every time we've went high, we went high yesterday afternoon, went high today. We see way more elk tracks, way lower. We've ran into elk lower. Kind of the interesting part about that is this year has been a very moist year and I think there is just food forage for cow elk everywhere. So you don't want to just, you know, hang your whole hat on the hunt to say, oh, I'm going to wait till they get there. They may not get here or they may not be here at all. So we're going to have to go to some of my spots that are much lower and we're going to spend the afternoon checking out a lot of them, just checking for sign and uh, hopefully maybe even we'll drive out of here in the dark and bugle in the dark and maybe we'll hear some bugles in the dark. But, you know, you always go to your first places that you've had, you know, as you're best e-scouted spots you go there first so we've been to pretty much uh, four spots let the elk tell you where they're at or at least where they aren't well we're here it's that time of day and if the road is correct it leads up to some more open not open, but kind of stuff where we've been seeing more elk sign in a different area. Elevation is exactly where all the other elk were at. So I think what we'll do is we'll go grab our stuff, track up there, see where it goes. Is it part of what happens with elk cutting that just humbles you? Spend all summer east scouting, giving yourself this plan and that plan. And in two days of hard hunting, we've heard three bugles, and we waited for the wind to get right on them. And we went in, and by the time, two or three hours later, for the wind to get good, no reply, nothing. It's too bad, I really like this spot. It'd be a really good place to kill an elk. Tons of feed, lots of bedding cover. 
Michael, if we were playing hockey, it's the end of the first period. Two days down out of six, so one third of the way through. But they say the second period is about taking control, and the third period is about keeping control. So we gotta take control, Michael. We gotta tell these elk just, you know, Who's running the joint? Right now, I'd say we're getting a face wash and getting our face checked into the board. For those of you who don't watch hockey, just know that we're getting our butt whooped. <laughs> 